This morning we are going to consider the book of Numbers, chapter 23, and I would request that if you're able, please rise to your feet. Numbers 23, 13 to 26. I'm reading from the CSB, Christian Standard Bible. The word of God says, Then Balak said to him, Please, come with me to another place where you can see them. You will only see the outskirts of their camp. You won't see all of them. From there, put a curse on them for me. So Balak took him to look outfield on top of Pisgah, built seven altars, and offered a bull and a ram on each altar. Balaam said to Balak, stay here by your burnt offering while I seek the Lord over there. The Lord met with Balaam and put a message in his mouth. Then he said, return to Balak and say what I tell you. So he returned to Balak, who was standing there by his burnt offering with the officials of Moab. Balak asked him, what did the Lord say? Balaam proclaimed his poem. Balak, get up and listen. Son of Zippor, pay attention to what I say. God is not a man that he might lie, or a son of man that he might change his mind. Does he speak and not act, or promise and not fulfill? I have indeed received a command to bless. Since he has blessed, I cannot change it. He considers no disaster for Jacob. He see no trouble for Israel. The Lord their God is with them, and there is rejoicing over the king among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He is like the horns of a wild ox for them. There is no magic curse against Jacob and no divination against Israel. It shall now be said about Jacob and Israel, what great things God has done. A people rise up like a lioness. They rouse themselves like a lion. They will not lie down until they devour the prey and drink the blood of the slain. Then Balak told Balaam, don't curse them and don't bless them. But Balaam answered him, didn't I tell you whatever the Lord says I must do? This is the word of the Lord. May have your seats. Now, um, in the 18th century, there lived a famous philosopher who was known as Voltaire. Voltaire was an aggressive atheist who wrote so much against Christianity and especially against the Bible. On one occasion, he boldly said, and I quote, a hundred years from my death, the Bible will be a forgotten book. It will be a museum piece. In what seemed as God's providential apologetic, about 58 years after Voltaire died, his own house was converted into a storehouse that sold and distributed books and tracts. Not just any other books and tracts, but Bibles, and gospel tracts. Now, some would call this a major cosmic comeback by God himself. And in this remarkable twist of events, we appreciate the fact that God is able to bring a good report right from a house of evil schemes, plans, and pronouncements of men. And now, that wasn't the first time when God was working in such ways. Thousands of years before Voltaire, in our text that we've just read, we see God taking up what was intended uh, to be a curse against Israel, and he turns it into a blessing for the Israelites. We see a story of a pagan king who intends to curse God's people through a wicked prophet in order to defeat the people of God in a battle against them. And in the same way, in a dramatic twist of events, instead of the wicked prophet declaring a curse or a series of curses against Israel, God apprehends him and he ends up pronouncing a series of serious blessings for the nation of Israel. It is as though the enemy is scheming to bring a village of curses upon the Israelites. And God, on the other hand, is planning to bring a whole galaxy of blessings upon the people of Israel. In our passage, we do hope to observe three things today. First is a gracious and a precious promise. Second is the power that propels the promise. 
And the third is the power produced by the promise. So think three things. A promise, the power that propels the promise, and the power that is produced by the promise. Now at this point, Israel is on their journey to the promised land. It's about 40 years since they left Egypt, and they are already out of Egypt, but not yet in the promised land. In this long journey in the wilderness, God has proven to be merciful and mighty to them. God has delivered them from defeats against the Amorites, the people of Gog, and now they have camped close to another enemy. They are almost getting into a fight with this enemy who are the Moabites. Gilead and Bashan have fallen, and Moab would be the next logical step. Now, what happens is that the king of Moab, who is known as Balak, is filled with fear because the Israelites are fast approaching. They have conquered a number of enemies on their way, and finally they are here. We are next in line, and most likely going by their historical record, they are going to decimate us. They are going to win this battle against us. This is because... In terms of soldiers, Israel had the numbers, but most importantly, they were numbered as the people of Yahweh. This deadly reputation of Israel of taking out their enemies had gone before them. Better put, the reputation of Yahweh had gone and preceded the Israelites. So Balak, the king of Moab, had to think fast and think well. He had to go back to the drawing board and strategize how to disarm this mighty army of the Israelites. And what could be more ingenious and powerful than to disarm these people with a curse? If only he could get a prophet to curse these people, then this would be a done deal. The battle would be over. I would disarm them and render them ineffective and go forth and fight them and win this battle. Balak reaches out to Balaam, who is a prophet, and tells him in chapter 22, verse 6. Please, chapter 22, verse 6 of Numbers. says, please come and put a curse on these people for me. Because they are more powerful than I am, I may be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that those you bless are blessed, and those you curse are cursed. Now, Balaam begins seeking God's word concerning Israel in in the hope that God would declare a curse over the Israelites through him. He does not do it once, but he does it Four times. Four times he goes to consult the Lord, and he hopes to hear a message from the Lord that would curse the people of Israel. The first attempt fails terribly. Now, the second attempt is the record of Scripture where we've just read from, and that's where our focus is going to be, um, to be around this morning. The extent to which Balak goes in the hope of securing a curse for the Israelites is could only be described as incredible. He is committed to cursing Israel with a sense of religious devotion. He builds seven altars and makes an offering of seven bulls and seven rams. Take note that he hopes his sacrifice will convince God to curse his own people. Long before this, he had offered gifts and a blank check to Balaam, the prophet, so that he would curse Israel. In summary, in the mind of Balak, he is thinking that if only I convince their Lord with this sacrifice and offer this prophet with this, you know, uh, blank check where he gets whatever he wants, then I am able to manipulate both the prophet of God and the God of the prophet. But as we are going to see, God is neither a man nor a son of man, that he should lie or change his mind. 
right at the heart of this evil plan, God shows up in a spectacular fashion and he declares a precious and a gracious promise for the Israelites. And this promise takes the shape of a blessing. Chapter 20, 23, verses 21 um, to 23. Says, in the middle of this evil scheme where Balak hopes to curse Israel, God's, God decides to show up and he makes this, this declaration about Israel. 21. He considers no disaster for Jacob. He sees no trouble for Israel. The Lord their God is with them, and there is rejoicing over the king among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He is like the horns of a wild ox for them. There is no magic curse against Jacob and no divination against Israel. It will now be said about Jacob and Israel, what great things God has done. God declares that there is no sorcery over Jacob and no divination against Israel. Instead of a curse against Israel, a blessing is declared. In other words, God is saying that Israel is under my own protection. Under his wings, they were safe and secure and immune to any curse. It did not matter whether it was from a state-sponsored prophet or a pagan magician. God would always watch over his own people. They needed such protection on a journey that was paved with many dangers, whether it was the sword of the Amalekites or the gods of the Canaanites or the snakes in the wilderness or even pagan kings like Balak himself. God's promise of protection was going to sail them through the journey. Later on in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 9, uh, no need to turn, that is recorded, uh, where God is speaking and God says, when Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam. So he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you from his hand. In this section, not only is God's protection guaranteed, but his presence is also promised. Read verse 21 with me. Verse 21, part B says, The Lord, their God, is with them. There is an assurance that God is not only going to protect them, but his presence is going to dwell amongst them. He shall not leave them at all. In the dangers of the wilderness, God will be there to protect his people. In the hunger and the thirst of the journey, he shall be there to provide. In the battlefield against an assortment of enemies, he shall be with them to bring victory. Of great encouragement to us today is that Yahweh is not an absentee God. He is a God who is present with his people. And his presence is active. He is there and he is actively protecting his people. He is not caught up in business trips and conferences that he forgets his covenant friends. He does not postpone or cancel audience with his children. He is with us in the pain of losing loved ones and in the joy of holding newborns. He is present to comfort us and to complete our joy. He is not absent in the anxiety of losing a job or the heaviness of raising wayward children. He is with us in the wilderness full of temptations and he is in our midst even right now, speaking to us, hearing us, saving sinners, sanctifying saints. He is available to receive our gratitude and hear our cry. He doesn't give us silent treatment. God does not blue tick us. <laughs> he is closer to us and he is more concerned about us more than even a brother. His promises are gracious and precious. Now this promise of protection to the Israelites is precious because it has been passed down to the people 
through generations. God established a covenant with their father Abraham and promised that his descendants shall be a blessed people. So we see it's not something that came out of the blues or out of nowhere. God had given a promise to them through their father Abraham and said that, you know, whoever shall bless you will be blessed, whoever shall cast shall be cast. So this uh, promise of protection is something that um, God had given to the people through a covenant and it was safe and secure and could not be altered in any way. It could not be compromised by anyone who intended to um, win a battle against them or even establish and pronounce a curse against the people. Secondly is that the promise is also gracious. It's not only precious, it's also a gracious promise. They did not deserve uh, this measure of grace um, from God. They were sinners. The Israelites were sinners who had failed terribly and miserably. They grumbled. They failed to trust in God. They gave into idolatry. Yet God, in his mercy, without any external persuasion or coercion, chose to bless them. And the good news is that these blessings given to Abraham's descendants are also ours by faith. In the book of Galatians, in the New Testament, Fast forward, chapter 3, verse 7. We are told that those who have faith in Christ are Abraham's children. If we have the faith of Abraham, then we share in the blessings of Abraham. So today, even we who are believers can rejoice that God's promise of protection and his promise of his presence is also true for us because we also share in the blessing of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. Because of God's abundant love for his people, there is joy that springs forth among the people, a joy that is ours as well. Observe verse 21 with me of Numbers. Verse 21 says, He considers no disaster for Jacob, he sees no trouble for Israel. The Lord, their God, is with them, and there is rejoicing over the king among them. Other translations say that the shout of a king is with them, but the general idea uh, from that is that the people are rejoicing. They are making shouts of um, happiness and joy around the king who is present among them. Um, it is the idea of jubilant celebration, around the king who takes care of them and protects uh, them. They do rejoice that God is their king. Now notice one thing, that even the blessings from God do not take their attention from God. Even when God has pronounced you know, protection over them, God has already declared his presence amongst them, their attention is not drawn away from God to the blessings. They do not idolize these blessings. God is their joy. Now in the New Testament, when Jesus miraculously enabled Peter and his company to catch a huge amount of fish that their nets began to, uh, their nets began to break, Peter did not scream, jackpot. No, 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 <laughs> he didn't do that. He fell down to his knees and recognized Jesus as Lord and he as a sinful man. The focus should always, always be on God. We also see that God's presence is that of a king. He's not just there as a, you know, as a buddy who is hanging out with the people, but his presence around them is that of a king. He is the one who rules and reigns over the people, and the people rejoice over the kingship and the rulership of Yahweh. It is a good thing that God is king. The promise-giving and promise-keeping king is the one who rules over them. Now, knowing the precious and gracious promises of God, it becomes a joy for us to submit to the kingship of God. Whatever he promises, we will believe. Whatever he commands, 
we will do. Whatever he does, we shall praise him. Knowing that God has preferred to protect us and be with us, our hearts flow with overwhelming joy that should characterize our posture and attitudes and be declared in our songs and sermons and be fostered in our families and fellowships and be modeled for both inside us and outside us. Because this joy is a pointer to a God who blesses us with his presence, his protection, and his gracious rule. Now, these promises are not merely abstract. Because sometimes we might think, you know, these promises are just speaking above our heads. And they look good on paper and in ink. But they are concrete, <coughs> concrete promises. The Israelites have already experienced the power and the mercy of God in their exodus from Egypt. God has acted before. Verse 22 is a reminder of God's mighty act on their behalf in the past. Chapter 23, Numbers, verse 22 says, God brought them out of Egypt. He is like the horns of a wild ox for them. Now, when facing a new enemy, uh, new challenges, new circumstances, it is easy for us to forget past victories. Here God is telling Balak, um, and in extension even us who are reading his word today, God is telling them, look at my track record. Here is my, if you please, curriculum vitae. This is my CV. This is what I have done in the past. In my track record is this great act of salvation that I did for my people, single-handedly. I frustrated Pharaoh. I drowned his soldiers. I struck Egypt with plagues. I opened the Red Sea for my children to walk on dry land. I protected the firstborns from death. I graced their journey from slavery with my presence. I did all this. Now, do you think you can curse God's people after what I have done um, in the past for them and led them out of slavery in Egypt? God is saying that my commitment to protect Israel shall overwhelm any attempts to harm the people. This is a concrete reminder even for us today that we should not forget previous victories that God has granted to us. Whether it was a victory over a stubborn sin or a special mercy that sailed us through difficulty. Most importantly, we should not forget how God mightily, graciously, and sacrificially redeemed us, we who are believers, from the slavery of sin. Our salvation history should never be unhinged from the treasures of our memory. In Christ, we are sure to enjoy God's presence and security. And in regards to our salvation, not even the most zealous enemy can pluck us out of the Father's hand. Indeed, by faith and in hope, we too can rejoice with Israel that there is no sorcery against Jacob and there is no divination against Israel. Now, how then can we be sure that these promises that God has given, these multidimensional, multifaceted promises that are rich, um, how can we be sure that they are true and that they are dependable, that we could actually depend on God to fulfill his promises? Thankfully, God has given us an assurance in his word. Now, let us look at the second thing, which is the power that propels the promise. Observe with me verse, verses 19 to 20. says, God is not a man that he might lie, or a son of man that he might change his mind. Does he speak and not act, or promise and not fulfill? I have indeed received a command to bless. Since he has blessed, I cannot change it. 
Now, if the promise of presence and protection is the vehicle that carries Israel through the journey in the wilderness, then God's character is the engine that actually drives this vehicle. Under the hood of this vehicle is a God who is faithful and a God who is unchangingly dependable. He is a God who is not a man that he should lie. He is not a son of man that he might change his mind. He is a faithful and a dependable God. These promises from God rest on the buttress of divine faithfulness and dependability. It is in his nature that he doesn't change and he doesn't fail. His faithful character is the heart that pumps life into the promises that he has decided to give to his people. The assurance that we have about the promises of God is the fact that God has spoken and that God will act upon his speech. It is important for us to see that God's character is consistent with his promises. The godness of God is the foundation upon which the promises of God rest. Now, sometimes we tend to pit some, um, some attributes of God against even the promises of God. Most of the time, we do that even unknowingly. For instance, we sometimes teach and receive that God's sovereignty, the fact that God is God, in a way that fosters doubt upon the promises of God. So that at the mention of a promise, it is advised that we should not be too confident about it. Why shouldn't I be too confident about a promise in God? Well, you know, God is sovereign. He is a sovereign God. And we tend to approach God's promises with fear and unbelief instead of trust and belief. Well, God is sovereign, and that is true. And because he is sovereign, he gave that promise as a sovereign God, and he will fulfill that promise as a sovereign God. The error of using God's sovereignty as a neutralizer of God's promises is one that hides in plain sight because of its popularity, especially in some circles. While you do not want to fall for false promises, you also do not want to not believe the things that God has promised. God's sovereignty should not short-circuit your faith in his promises. It, it should solidify your trust and assurance in the promises of God. In the Bible, whenever the sovereignty of God is assumed, explained, implied, or applied, it is to comfort, to assure, and to foster the believer's confidence in the trustworthiness of God. And when it comes to God's promises, his sovereign, sovereignty tells us that he is a sovereign promise giver as well as a sovereign promise keeper. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? The promises of God are consistent with the character of God. He is not a man that he should lie. Human beings fail in keeping their promises. We fail in many ways. We promise ourselves that we will do something, but shortly after that, we have forgotten what we already promised. Um, when January comes, we are quick to write New Year resolutions, but we forget them as quickly as we wrote them. We can't even keep the things that we commit ourselves to, um, to keep. We break promises that we give to other people. Yet God is not like a man. He is not like us. He is a God who is reliable. And because he's a reliable God, we can take all our cares to him. The most appropriate response to the faithful character of God is to actually believe. Let me just pause and ask a question to us this morning. What is the posture of your heart whenever you pray? Do you pray in accordance to the promises of God and with faith in the character of God? Do you think of 
trusting God as an important component of your prayer so that you wholly believe that whatever God has promised in his word, whatever God has spoken, he is able and he is willing to bring whatever he has said to fruition. So that as I pray, my posture is one of expectation. My posture is one that is humble enough to submit to the fact that God himself has said, whatever I have spoken, I must accomplish it. James chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Let's turn quickly to James in the New Testament. Uh, James, after Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, Let me read from verse 5. James writes and says, Now, if anyone of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For the doubter is like the surging sea, driven and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all his ways. So God is a reliable God. Let God be true and all men be liars. God is dependable and trustworthy. And we can commit our trust and our faith in him wholly and confidently. He is a God from whom we can derive our worth and fashion our ambitions because he is dependable. He is a God to whom we can channel our praises and confess our sins. He is the God that we can anchor our hopes and present our requests. The God that we can ask for our daily bread and receive eternal life. We can ask for the healing of our bodies and the forgiveness of our sins. We can trust for a roof over our heads and for security against the schemes of the devil, for the sustaining of our lives, and for the preservation of our faith. God is well able to do these things because he delights in fulfilling his word amongst his people. It is amazing to think that God is gracious enough to fulfill his word for our good, yet in and on and in and of ourselves, we do not deserve this level of kindness. Think, think of the original recipients of this measure of mercy, the Israelites. They had sinned in many ways. Even in the face of God's mighty work among them, they continued to sin. They continued to rebel against God. They were full of unbelief, and many of them fell into idolatry. Yet, God, in his mercy, shielded them from a curse without them deserving. Everything, anything that they rightfully deserved was a curse for the sins that they committed. But God was gracious enough to shield them from this curse that they rightfully deserved. They enjoyed God's grace undeservingly. The Israelites had gone through the waters of the Red Sea miraculously, They had gone through the wilderness where God miraculously provided food for them, but they still grumbled. With a little testing, they bowed down before idols. They failed to image God in many ways. With their impatience, idolatry, and unbelief, God still prevented a curse from befalling them. God treated them to a table of blessing. He treated them way better than they deserved. He even called them my son. He looked at Israel and he considered them to be my son. Now, on the other hand, fast forward to the New Testament. We do have the true son of God, the begotten son of God, the true Israel, Jesus Christ. After going through the waters of baptism, he went into the wilderness to be tempted. He was hungry, yet he did not grumble in any way. He was tempted to idolatry and to test God. He did not fail in this way. He did not bulge a bit with the allure of illegitimate power and possession. Unlike Balaam, who later betrayed uh, Israel, 
because of wealth. And like the Israelites who failed to image God in their disobedience, Christ obeyed God perfectly, even to the call to give up his own life for the sake of another. Yet, with all these things, with all this perfection and obedience and, and goodness, God did not shield Christ from the curse. For our sake, Jesus Christ became a curse. Scripture says that cursed is the one who is hung on a tree. He died as a punishment for our sin so that we may enjoy the blessing of belonging in God's family. If you're here today and you're not a believer, there's good news for you today. If you look away from yourself, from your achievements and abilities, from your own failures and disappointments, from your family and friends, if you look from yourself and behold the Son of God who became a curse for us, who suffered the pain and the death that we deserved, if you look to him in faith and in repentance, you will be accepted as a son of God alongside the son of God. There is nothing that we bring to the table apart from our own sin. And they are many, and they are shameful, and they are serious. Yet God is willing to pardon all of them for the sake of his son, who took all the sins of all the time of all the people who will believe, including you, who shall look to him today in faith and repentance. Now, there's, more even, there's even more good news to, to, to all of this, that God not only saves, but he also gives them, uh, he gives his people the power to participate in his mission. Now, having looked at the promise that God has given to us and the power which is the foundation on which these promises rest, which is the character of God and his faithfulness, we now turn and look at the product of God's grace that springs from his character. And the final point, which is the power produced by the promise. Um, Numbers chapter 23, verse 24. Verse 24 says, A people rise up like a lioness. They rouse themselves like a lion. They will not lie down until they devour the prey and drink the blood of the slain. Now, this assurance that God is going to protect his people supplies the people with strength. And like a lioness, they rise from passivity into action. They are not inactive or passive. They have been given the momentum, the wherewithal needed for the mission ahead. Remember that the Israelites are now close to the promised land, but they have to take out the enemies that they face on their way before they possess the land. This image of a lioness and a lion paints a picture of the frightening measure of Israel's military might that God has given to them. God's declaration that a curse, a trouble, a disaster shall not befall them should encourage them to move forward and face the enemy by faith. Clearly, Balak needed to hear this about God. He, was, he needed to hear that God is not going to let his people be defeated, that God is going to protect his people. He would not leave them unattended. And it's not just Balak who needs to hear of God's character and God's promises to his people. Today, the nations need to hear about this God. They need to hear about his faithfulness. They need to hear about his greatness and his promise and ability to save. We must speak. Now, imagine if, if, if Balaam um, had decided that he is going to please the king of Moab, Balak, and instead of telling him what God has said about his people, if he decided to tell them that God has declared to curse them um, and not bless them, and then he went ahead and pronounced a curse over the people of, um, of, of Israel, it would have been 
it would have been a disaster for the Moabites because they would have a false sense of security and a false hope for a victory. And that's exactly what we do when we conceal or compromise the message that comes from God. If we do not preach the word of God in all of its truthfulness, we give the world a false hope and a false confidence in their ability and in their own resources. So for us today, what should we do? What is our mission here on earth? Definitely we are not going about, you know, physically fighting our enemies and, you know, taking up swords and bombs and ammunition and going to fight them. But God has called us to a special mission. And this is the mission of preaching the gospel amongst the nations. We have to tell the truth without compromise, especially in the face of the allure of wealth and power. Now, in the 13th century, there lived a theologian and philosopher. Some of us might know him. Uh, his name was Thomas Aquinas. Um, he was in the Catholic Church. Now, at some point during his lifetime, the Pope, who was the head of the Catholic Church, decided to invite him over to his palace. Therefore, Thomas Aquinas went, and when he got to the palace of uh, the, the, the Pope, yes, the Pope had a palace. Um, and, and when he went there, he found um, the Pope counting a huge amount of gold coins. And Thomas Aquinas was amazed and stunned by the opulence of the church. The pursuit of, the, of wealth had greatly weakened the church. And when Thomas Aquinas stood before the Pope, the Pope looked at him. And then he said to Thomas Aquinas, Thomas, look, the church is now very wealthy. No longer can the church say, silver and gold we do not have. <laughs> now, Thomas looked at the Pope and responded to him, and I quote, he said, and neither can the church say, arise and walk. That was the response of um, Thomas Aquinas. I'm sure you're wondering what happened after that, what the Pope said after that. <laughs> now, I'm also curious, if you want to know what happened after that, we have an AH that happens every Sunday morning on church history, <laughs> 9 to 10. You might want to consider attending that class, and uh, we will be sure to benefit uh, from that conversation of Thomas Aquinas and, 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 and the Pope. The point is, let us not lose any opportunity to declare God's promises and God's character to the world. Let us not compromise because of you know, the allure of wealth and the allure of power, of power. We should preach the truth of God, especially as enshrined in the gospel. We should and we must preach the promise that pronounces life and joy to those who believe. Whether God grants us the audience of the king or the audience of your taxi driver or your taxi customer, a classmate or a colleague at work, a fellow member of your little charmer or a fellow passenger in the matatu, your boss at work or your servant at home, behind the pulpit, before the pulpit, or even without the pulpit, whatever audience God grants you, preach the gospel to the people. Engage in the mission of God faithfully and truthfully without, without any compromise because God has empowered us. Your gospel ministry may not be as glamorous before the eyes of men, but done faithfully, it is no less glorious in the sight of God. It is the greatest act of love that we could show to our neighbors and our enemies, showing that we not only care about, our, about their temporal needs, but we also are concerned and mainly even concerned about their eternal state and fate. Like Balaam, in his more sober moments, we should, in humility and submission, say, whatever the Lord says, I must do. That's in verse 26. Remember that God has empowered us in Christ and with Christ to reach out to the nations. Christ has promised to be with us to the end of the age. 
His promise breathes life, and we rise as God's co-workers in the nations. His power propels us um, to move forward. His power expels fear and frustrates any senses of defeat and resignation. His presence provides the impetus that we need to execute his mission in the world. God has already liberated us from the slavery of sin, and he expects us to now move forward and be part of his work here on earth, the work of conquering the hearts of men and women through the gospel. Therefore, we, we must speak, and we must speak what God has declared. The boldness that we require is only possible if we go with the Lord. For if his presence and protection does not go with us, then we are to be most pitied here on earth. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the gift that is your word. We thank you for the lessons that you have taught us today. Thank you for reminding us about your dependable character and your grace that you have um, shown us in the promises that you've declared for us. We thank you so much that even um, in the Old Testament we can see and learn um, a lot of truths uh, about you, um, truths which are helpful for us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would take these things and um, just use them to grow us, use them to enable us to, um, to move forward and to be strengthened and to act um, not in cowardice but in boldness to act in accordance to the promises that you've given us. We thank you so much for the great salvation that you have brought to us, for having redeemed us from slavery, from the slavery of sin, and um, having walked with us, and still walking with us even in this journey as we await to get to the promised land. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would accomplish these things for our joy and for the fame of your name. These things we do ask in Christ's name. Amen.